Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. In the past 15 years, families in the United States have adopted more than 200,000 children from other countries and over 20,000 from South Korea. The origins of America's status as an adoption nation lie in the years after the Second World War, and oftentimes in humanitarian intentions. Yet adoption is also linked to problematic phenomena, from racial preferences on the side of the adopters to economic interest in the adoptees' home countries. To learn more about the adoptions that link America and Korea, we had the pleasure to interview Catherine Seniza Choi. She spoke to us about the historical roots of this phenomenon and the intentions that drive it, the particular development of adoptions from Korea to the United States, and the many interpretations and problems that arise from them. Catherine Seniza Choi is Professor of Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies at UC Berkeley. She is the author of the book Global Families, A History of Asian International Adoption in America, as well as various journal articles and another book on international adoption. Choi received a PhD in history from the University of California in Los Angeles, an MA from the same school, and a BA from Pomona College. Professor Catherine Seniza Choi, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. It's nice to be here. First of all, what brought you to Korea? Well, I'm here in Korea for the 2015-2016 academic year as a Fulbright Distinguished Lecturer at Yonsei University. The Fulbright is a U.S. government-sponsored exchange program between the United States and many different countries throughout the world, but I really wanted to come to Korea. The first time I came to Korea was in 2010 for research and uh, scholarly exchange, but I was only here for two weeks. I came with my husband, who is also an academic, and we presented a paper on Korean international adoption at an international symposium on Korean adoption studies that was held in Seoul in 2010. And we had an amazing time, both scholarly as well as personally. And so ever since that experience, I wanted to return. The second reason I really wanted to come to Korea is more personal, and it has to do with my husband. He has Korean heritage from his father's side, and he's a third generation Korean American. So my husband and I, we have two children who are now teenagers, and they have Korean heritage as well. So coming to Korea was also to learn more about Korean history and culture and to expose ourselves as well as our children to Korean heritage. We want to talk today about the adoption of Asian children, and especially Korean children, by families in the United States. According to data by the American State Department, American families adopted some 250,000 children from other countries between 2000 and 2015. As you wrote, this makes the United States an international adoption nation. Let's start with a basic question. Why do American families decide to adopt children and especially children from abroad. My book, Global Families, really tried to tackle this question of why the United States is an international adoption nation historically. And I think we tend to think of this phenomenon of international adoption in the United States as something more contemporary, something more recent, maybe late 20th century or even early 21st century. And as you pointed out, the statistics seem to suggest that this is something more recent. But the reality is, is that this phenomenon has a history, and it's a history that's inextricably linked to a post-World War II and a Cold War history in which the United States government and its military became involved and established a presence in nations throughout the world. And they established a presence in places like 
Japan, Korea, Vietnam, for example. And this kind of history has an impact. And it created a supply of mixed race children who were born of Asian women and American servicemen and who found themselves ostracized in their Asian societies, but who also found themselves abandoned and deserted by the U.S. military government and their U.S. fathers. So out of this supply, you also have reasons in the United States, especially in the 1960s and the 1970s, regarding why American parents would start to look internationally for adoption. So there are certain social contexts that become really important. For example, the decreasing supply of babies for adoption in the United States as a result of the introduction of the birth control pill, as a result of the legalization of abortion, for example, taking place in the early 1970s, for example. You combine those things along with an increasing legitimacy of single parenting as well in the United States in the second half of this 20th century. And so you have this emergence of a supply of adoptable children overseas and then a decreasing supply domestically with, within the United States. So that's one of the explanations or one of the reasons um, why American parents start to look abroad. There are many reasons that I mention in the book, but the other reason I want to mention has to do with a cultural shift and a cultural shift that was popularized by the media, for example, where mainstream media started to publicize stories of the plight of Asian children, especially mixed race children overseas. And they started to publicize the stories of pioneering American families who adopted these children, especially in the context of humanitarian rescue. And This kind of narrative making, this kind of depiction of the media started to make international adoption popular on a mass level, something that was palatable or even desirable as a phenomenon for American families. Would you say that America is unique in this regard? That's a great question. I think on one level, it is unique. It's unique in the sense that demographically, it leads the world in terms of American citizens adopting children from around the world. The United States is the the leading recipient of internationally adopted children. So in that sense, it's, it's unique. But it's not the only country that adopts internationally. For example, in the phenomenon of Korean international adoption, you have European countries like France, Sweden, Denmark, for example. There have been families there who have also adopted Korean children in in significant numbers. I think what makes people look to the United States as a prominent example of this phenomenon has to do with their much larger numbers but there's also significant international adoption by other countries. Also, more recently, Spain has become a leading recipient of internationally adopted children, especially children from China. Children from Asian countries play a significant role in this context. Of those adopted in the past 15 years, a third are from China and some 8% from South Korea. Why do Asian countries seemingly feature so prominently in the list of adoptees' origins? I think it's a combination of both recent changes, both in terms of Asian sending countries of adoptive children, as well as changes going on in the United States. So I think in terms of the turn to China, we saw that in larger numbers, especially in the early 1990s. And this had to do in part with an increasing supply of adoptive children, and especially Chinese girls from China, um, who as a result of China's one-child policy, in combination 
with, at the time, what had been new laws in China regarding the transparency of international adoption made China a major choice for American families in terms of adopting internationally. At the same time, there were also changes taking place regarding Korean international adoption that made turning to China more attractive. So by the late 1980s, Korean international adoption, the policies regarding it started to change. And in the 1950s, the 1960s, even the 1970s, the Korean government had actively encouraged international adoption of some Korean children. But by the late 1980s, especially after the negative media coverage that the Korean government received during the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, the Korean government's policy started to shift on international adoption from Korea, and they started to encourage more Korean domestic adoption as opposed to international adoption. So you combine these changes in China alongside changes in Korean policy and alongside then the impact for American families and you start to see some of the nuances regarding why American families look to specific Asian countries for international adoption. In your book, you refer to authors who argue that this phenomenon illustrates a racial preference for Asian children over African American children. Do you agree with this argument? And what might be the reasons for this preference? I think there is a preference that some scholars refer to for adopting Asian children as opposed to African American children that are grounded in terms of the history and popularity of particular kinds of stereotypes of Asians in in general, but then can be applied to Asian children in relation to stereotypes of African Americans. So when some scholars, for example, talk about a preference for the international adoption of Asian children, sometimes that preference is grounded in the stereotype of the model minority. This is a stereotype that presents Asians as well as Asian Americans as an ideal migrant, an ideal racial and ethnic minority group. And they're ideal because they have an innate hard work ethic. They have an innate intelligence uh, that makes them particularly skilled (laughs) in particular kinds of fields like math and, and science. They have this image of being willing to work hard and pull themselves up in order to be successful in American society. And so sometimes the stereotype is related to Asian children having a more flexible racial difference so that even if they are being adopted not only internationally but transracially, meaning being adopted by parents of a different racial background and specifically who are white Americans, that this racial difference can be overcome because of these kinds of stereotypes that lead to a particular kind of preference. What makes the model minority stereotype pernicious or dangerous is that even though it seems like a positive stereotype or a positive image, it's actually dangerous because it's often a stereotype that does not stand alone in and of itself, but it exists in relation to negative stereotypes of other racial groups and for example, African Americans and African American children as perhaps not being as flexible, not being as assimilable in American families and specifically families of a different racial background, um, families in which there are white parents. So some of those stereotypes have been used to explain a preference for Asian children as opposed to African-American children. 
For me in my research, because I was focusing on an earlier history of Asian international adoption, especially from the 1950s to the 1970s, I saw some of this preference in my archival research, but I don't think it has become as prominent as it might have in the later 20th century. I think the history that I was writing about the preference for Asian children was quite unique in the sense that there was a preference in the 1950s and 1960s for mixed race children. And there definitely was a, a connection that was being made between American parents, white American parents predominantly, but also African American parents in the United States who looked to mixed race children, mixed Asian and white American children, mixed Asian and African American children in specific Asian countries and felt a connection to these children because they were part American, white American and African American. And so I think there was a certain kind of pull because of that and the model minority preference that we read about in some of the scholarship, I think, might be more applicable to a later period. Earlier, we asked you why Americans adopt foreign children. This time, you would like to zoom in on Korea specifically. To use your own words, why have tens of thousands of predominantly white American families adopted Korean children? Korea is so important in terms of the history of Asian international adoption in the United States. Korea historically is the world's leading sending country of adoptive children. Over 200,000 Korean children have been adopted internationally, primarily in the United States, but also in specific European countries as well. And I think the reason for this is complex compared to other countries, and it has to do in large part with the Cold War and with U.S. involvement in the Korean War from 1950 to 1953. That war certainly devastated Korean society, but because also of active U.S. involvement, there was a large group of mixed race Korean and American children who were born of Korean women and American servicemen. And these mixed race Korean and American children in the 1950s and 1960s were ostracized by Korean society. The country was devastated, so homeless children in general uh, were also suffering, but those children who were of mixed parentage, and especially of mixed American parentage, were ostracized and discriminated against. And they were discriminated against for a number of reasons. They were born of Korean women, mostly out of wedlock, they were born of American servicemen, many of whom abandoned their Korean children. And even for those American servicemen and Korean women who wanted to get married and wanted to keep their children, those marriages were actively discouraged by the U.S. government. The children were also discriminated in Korean society because they looked different. And perhaps even more importantly, they embodied an unequal political relationship between the United States and Korea. So you have this group of mixed race Korean and American children who formed the first group of a supply of adoptable Korean children, especially for American families abroad. And at the same time, the Korean government actively promoted international adoption of Korean orphans, of mixed race children, as a way to try to deal with the aftermath of war and the incredible poverty of Korean society uh, after 1953. Another reason that makes Korea unique is that you had 
individual adoption advocates who were working on the ground in Korea to promote and to facilitate the adoption of Korean children by American families. And so one of the major individual advocates was a man named Harry Holt, who was from Oregon, a farmer. He and his wife, Bertha, themselves adopted eight Korean children in the aftermath of the Korean War. And he would become one of the most prominent advocates of Korean international adoption in the 1950s. And he's someone who was charismatic. And so you combine his charisma with Korean government policy and with Korean society's ostracism of mixed race children, as well as the lack of accountability by the US government to also support these children in Korea. And all of these things contribute to the rise of Korea as a major sending country of international adoptive children. Is there, so to speak, a common story behind these adoptions? What happened to the biological parents of the children most of the time? Well, the story of Asian international adoption is one that's filled with many different stories. And so I don't want to suggest that there is one singular narrative that can generalize this experience. But I do think we see certain historical patterns or themes, especially in this pioneering period of international adoption from Asia, the 1950s to the 1970s. And so, for example, a number of these children who were adopted, they were generalized as orphans or generally called orphans, but they were not true orphans in the sense that they had lost both of their parents in the aftermath of the war, for example. And many of them who were adopted actually uh, from Japan and Korea specifically had living parents and they often had their birth mothers who were still living but who had to relinquish or give up their children, often in circumstances not of their own choosing, circumstances such as poverty, lack of government support, ostracism by both Asian societies as well as the American government and and military. So there is that theme of this notion that the child had, if not parents, living parents, other living relatives uh, who they were separated from in this experience. There's also, I think, a pattern of children who were adopted from Asia in the United States, and this is more a story or a narrative that was popularized by the American media during this time period, that the children were happy and they experienced a smooth transition to the United States. And it was nothing but a joyful experience for both the American adoptive parents as well as the Asian adoptive children. And my research shows that this seamless, joyful story was more of a stereotype as opposed to a lived experience. And that realistically, yes, there were joys regarding the adoption of Asian children by American families during this Cold War period, but there were also a number of difficulties. Some of the Asian adoptive children were old enough to remember their living relatives, old enough to remember their birth mothers or their Asian foster mothers. And it was traumatic for a number of them. It was an incredibly difficult experience to be separated uh, from their loved ones and to have to adjust to a new place, a whole new culture where 
They often didn't speak any English language, for example, and their American adoptive parents, even with the best intentions, who some of them tried to learn a little Korean language, for example, or, or Japanese, but uh, had much difficulty communicating with the children. Um, some of these experiences are heartbreaking. And so I think it's a, a more truthful portrayal of this history to say that there was a common experience of joy in terms of creating a new kind of family, but there was also a lot of stress and anxiety and sorrow that was associated with this experience. You locate, to quote you, a watershed in the history of Asian international adoption in the so-called Hong Kong project that began in 1955. Could you briefly explain what this project was all about and why you regard it as so significant? The Hong Kong project was a project that was started by a non-sectarian, non-governmental organization called the International Social Service United States of America branch in the mid-1950s. And the general idea behind the Hong Kong Project was that there were refugee children living in Hong Kong whose families were fleeing the communist mainland China. And sadly, the conditions in which they lived in Hong Kong were deplorable in terms of overcrowding, limited future opportunities for education and socioeconomic mobility, and poverty. And so a number of Chinese families who had fled the mainland to go to Hong Kong relinquished their children for adoption. The International Social Service, USA branch, then used the Hong Kong Project to arrange for the adoption of some of these Chinese refugee children from Hong Kong by American families. What was unique about this program is that we tend to think of Asian international adoption as a transracial phenomenon where primarily white American families adopt Asian children. We tend to think of it that way in more contemporary times, but in the 1950s and 1960s, social service agencies still tried to have um, Asian American parents adopt Chinese children, for example, and specifically in this case, Chinese American families adopting Chinese refugee children in Hong Kong. And what they found was when the ISS USA publicized this project of international adoption, they targeted Chinese American families in cities like San Francisco, where there was a large Chinese American population. But what the ISS USA discovered was that a large number of white American families expressed interest in adopting Chinese children. These Chinese children were quote unquote, full-blooded Chinese children. They were not the mixed race Korean and American children or the mixed race Japanese and American children who were fathered by U.S. servicemen, but rather were full-blooded Chinese children. And the ISS USA observed that white American families were interested in adopting these Chinese children. And so this was an important turn. It is what I call a watershed, a break from the past, in the sense that there was more of an open willingness to transracially adopt children who were not necessarily born of American fathers and specifically American servicemen. Did this Hong Kong project affect South Korea in any way? Well, I think it affected South Korea in the sense that the ISS USA was also facilitating adoptions from South Korea at the same time that they were doing the Hong Kong project. 
And what happened was once they started the Hong Kong project, by the 1960s, the ISS USA was facilitating more international adoptions from Hong Kong as opposed to South Korea. So I think there was a relationship between the two sending countries in the context of the work of the ISS USA, that they started to focus on Hong Kong and specifically Chinese refugee children. And there were now less numbers of Korean children who were being adopted by American families through the ISS USA. And so what does this mean? I think what this means is that international adoption and its history is largely dependent also on the work of agencies, on the work of advocacy in specific countries. And there isn't something innate about Korea that makes it a sending country of adoptive children. Rather, that history is something that's actively created. You've mentioned agencies. Could you maybe describe what the typical adoption process is like? Does it always go through an agency? Well, typically, international adoption does occur through an agency. Um, But I would point out that I think in terms of a typical process of adoption is something that has really changed over time. So, for example, in this earlier period of Asian international adoption, beginning in the 1950s, I think the typical adoption process was more chaotic in the sense that some American families who were adopting did work through agencies and they worked through social service agencies, for example, the International Social Service USA branch. But other adoptive parents at that time in the United States also worked through individual advocates of adoption, such as Harry Holt, for example, or Pearl Buck and her founding of the International and Interracial uh, Welcome House. And so then I think the process of adoption was not as institutionalized as it perhaps is today. And you have occurrences of a phenomenon called proxy adoption, for example, where parents, adoptive parents, would adopt a child from Asia sight unseen, is the phrase they would use to describe proxy adoption. It's when you have a third party in the Asian country completing and facilitating the adoption for you, as opposed to going through a longer and more bureaucratic process. So I think in the 50s and 60s, there were different kinds of options and different kinds of processes of adoption. Today, I think there are options as well, but prospective adoptive families do need to work through an agency. And if they're going to adopt legally, they need to work through approved agencies, whether private or state-run agencies in the United States. And typically, it's a bureaucratic process. And when we think about the process of adoption in popular media, whether it's on mainstream TV comedy shows like Modern Family, for example, I think mainstream media glosses over this bureaucracy, but the typical adoption process is about working through an agency. It's about being interviewed and being investigated regarding your background. It's about making numerous kinds of choices in terms of which agency you're going to go through, what part of the world might you be adopting internationally from. And it's also a process that's complicated by finances, which is something that the mainstream media, especially when it's portraying joyful stories, will gloss over the stress and anxiety regarding the financial aspect 
of the adoption process because there are a number of processing fees that accompany bureaucratic process of adoption. As you just mentioned, international adoptions go through specialized agencies. Yet, while these have the responsibility to care for the welfare of the children, they also have clear economic incentives to have the children adopted. How did this play out in Korea? It is true that social service agencies and adoption agencies specifically have an obligation to care for the children. They have an ethical obligation to work in the best interests of the children. However, I do think that there might be at times, sometimes intentional, but also inadvertent impact of international adoption, and that is the impact of the commodification of children, Asian children, but also specifically Korean children for an international adoption market. And because there are fees involved regarding adoption processing, and because it is an expensive phenomenon in the sense that the adoptive parents need to have a certain kind of socioeconomic status to be able to adopt and to work with agencies and to pay a number of these fees, there is a way in which international adoption has also led to corruption, it has led to fraud, it's led to a kind of market that some scholars have characterized as a form of human trafficking or forced migration. So these are some of the very negative impacts of a global industry or global market of international adoption of children. And I don't think it's unique to Korean adoptive children, but I also think that Korean children have certainly been commodified by this overall market. I also want to say, though, that I think this growth of adoption as a major global industry and market is something that becomes more prominent in the late 20th and early 21st century. And in my research on the earlier history of Asian international adoption, I didn't see the growth of the market in the way one might observe in more recent times. Because in the 1950s and 1960s, This history is very much about the aftermath of war, specifically the Korean War. It's very much about humanitarian desires to adopt mixed race children who were being discriminated against by their Asian societies, as well as also confronting desertion from their American fathers and the U.S. government. So I think this situation has really changed over time, and the market mentality, I think, becomes more prominent in the late 20th century. At the same time, I also want to add that there have been abuses of international adoption in this earlier period that I talk about in my book, Global Families. And the abuses from my research stem, I think, less about a global market or industry, but the abuses come from non-professional and more individual advocacy of international adoption without professional expertise. So the use of proxy adoption, for example, in the 1950s and 1960s, Uh, led to abuses. And by abuses, I'm talking about the adoption of Korean children, for example, by American families who probably would not have been approved for adoption through a more institutionalized social service agency process. 
Earlier, you mentioned that the Korean state promoted international adoption early on. Why is that? Did they have any direct benefit from it? The South Korean government did promote international adoption from Korea in the 1950s, in the 1960s, and even through the 1970s. And it continues, actually, to send adoptive children abroad, even in more recent times, albeit in much fewer numbers. So, yes, they benefited from it, but I think it's important to understand that government officials also were not working in conditions of their choosing, especially in the aftermath of the Korean War. The country was devastated. There were so many different groups of people who needed help. And then there were new categories of people who emerged out of war, such as mixed-race children of Korean women and American servicemen. And so in a context like that, where you have incredible devastation and so many children suffering as a result of war, the Korean government promoted international adoption as a solution for these children to try to give them some kind of future. Because at that time, especially in the mid-1950s, that future seemed so bleak. So I think to understand why the government did that, one has to take into account the chaotic and emergency situation of the war and what incredible poverty on the ground looks like and feels like and how it can impact children. So I think that helps explain why they would promote something like international adoption. I do think, however, as time went on and as time moved in a way that the aftermath of the war started to move more and more into the past, there were changes and there were improvements in South Korean society, but the government chose to continue to promote international adoption. And they benefited um, from that decision in the 60s and the 70s and, and the 1980s. When you do that, a government then can focus on sending children out as opposed to supporting children and their relatives within. So one of the benefits is that rather than creating a stronger investment and larger economic investment as well as social investment in keeping families together in Korea, the decision was made to look overseas instead for that kind of support of these children. And so I think there is a benefit. I mean, as an historian, we try not to make predictions per se. History or the way things unfold is not inevitable. But I think what historians, what we can do is show that this phenomenon of Korean international adoption is something that's created by decisions made, not just by individual Korean families and individual American families, but also by governments and also by policies. Policies that might not seem to be directly related to adoption, but then contribute to the rise of international adoption. Some have argued that South Korea's development is linked to its international adoption policies. Would you agree? There have been scholars and artists who have made that point that South Korea's economic miracle is inextricably linked to its history of promoting Korean international adoption. And I think they make a good, insightful point in the sense that the government invested in sending children overseas as opposed to investing economically, politically, and socially 
into social services, for example, that would keep those children and their relatives here within Korea. So I do think they make a good point. I guess I would also add, too, that we don't know what would have happened had those children remained here with their families. And I'm not about to predict what what might have happened, but I think what that decision does to promote international adoption as opposed to keeping children here is that we won't know then the potential of what would have happened had that population stayed, had their families remained together, what would they have contributed to Korean society? The position of the South Korean government on international adoption eventually changed. Could you tell us more about this process? And did any specific event contributed to it? There was a change in South Korean government policy, and I think the main turning point happened in the late 1980s when South Korea hosted the Olympics in 1988 in Seoul. It brought worldwide attention to Korea to its history, its culture, its incredible modernity in the late 20th century. And with that media coverage of South Korea's achievements also came a media coverage that was critical, a coverage that included critiques of the South Korean government sending its most precious resource, and that is its own children, overseas to be adopted and to be cared for by foreign families. And so this was an irony. (laughs) This was a form of insult to South Koreans, the government, but also the, the population in general, which is how is it that a country so modern and so advanced could also distinguish itself by sending so many children overseas. And as I've mentioned, so much of that international adoption was the outcome of the aftermath of the Korean War. But that was then, and this was the late 1980s. And so after this irony, this contradiction was publicized, the South Korean government changed its policy, in part from this domestic as well as global criticism, and tried to promote domestic adoption, that is, adoption within Korea. It is important, though, to acknowledge that even though we don't have the high numbers of adoption of Korean children in the late 20th century and early 21st century that we saw in previous decades, that international adoption from Korea still continues. It still continues. And so it's something that has not ended completely. It hasn't gone away, and it continues to influence the history of Korea. To expand on this, South Korea seems to play a role incommensurate with its actual size. Between 1958 and 1990, 130,000 Korean children were adopted, and more than 20,000 children from Korea were adopted during the past 15 years. Are we witnessing the same forces at play still today? Well, today, international adoption from South Korea continues, but we don't see it in the same way we observed this phenomenon in the 1950s, the 1960s, and 1970s. We do see a major decrease in terms of numbers. We do see a change in Korean government policy that has advocated for more domestic adoption within Korea and not solely international adoption. And we see a very different kind of Korea. Um, It's really difficult to do justice and compare Korea of the late 20th and early 21st century with Korea from the 1950s and 1960s. It does 
seem like a different world um, in so many different ways. And one of the lenses we can view that difference actually is, is through adoption and some of the changes that have occurred with adoption. And those changes include not just decreasing numbers by the late 20th, early 21st century, but it also includes, I think, a unique phenomenon, at least unique for now, which is that because so many Korean adoptees uh, have now come of age and that there's a longer history of this phenomenon from Korea, you now have Korean adoptees who are adults. They're no longer children. They are forming organizations in the United States. They're forming organizations in European countries. They're forming international organizations. And those Korean adult adoptees are creating new kinds of kinship or new kinds of families, if you will, that go beyond biology or formal adoption in which they are making connections with one another and they are returning to Korea. Some certainly to try to reunite if they are able to with their birth families, but also to live in Korea and to claim a Korean identity and heritage in a way that is different than other Koreans who were non-adopted, but that is nevertheless contributing to the modern Korea that we know today. In your book, you repeatedly show that these adoptions have received various interpretations. Some see them as a humanitarian act, as the rescue of children. Others look at them as a form of kidnapping or even human trafficking. Could you talk a bit more about these interpretations and Looking back, what do you think of this question? Korean international adoption has been interpreted in very binary and at times extremely opposing ways. And one of the ways in which it has been interpreted has been as a form of humanitarian rescue. And historically, there is some truth to this interpretation. This interpretation really emerges from a very specific historical context. It emerges out of the post-Korean War context. It emerges from a history of mixed race Korean and American children who were abused and who were ostracized in Korean society. And so, the idea of adoption was interpreted as a form of rescue at that point in time in the sense that the conditions they were living in were deplorable at the time and there wasn't much opportunity for socioeconomic mobility or even basic human survival in that sense immediately after the war. So there's some truth to that interpretation other kind of interpretation of Korean international adoption is one that views it as a form of forced migration and human trafficking, one that is filled with corruption and abuse. And we also have to acknowledge that there's some truth to that interpretation, that when you adopt children internationally, Sometimes it can be a good thing, but we have also seen historically how it has also contributed to further abuse of these children, either through the adoption by parents in the United States who were abusive themselves and were not qualified to be parents of these children, or we can see abuse in terms of the falsification of records and documents and the use of Korean children to assume different kinds of identities, false identities in the process of adoption. So there is also truth to the interpretation of Korean international adoption as one of exploitation and abuse and fraud. For me, however, even though we need to understand these interpretations on their own terms and in their unique historical context, 
I don't think this either or binary thinking of adoption is as realistic or as truthful. And I think it is more truthful that a history of Korean international adoption take into account both the aspect of humanitarianism that was associated with this phenomenon, especially in its earlier decades, but that it also takes into account that actual abuses have occurred and that there are histories that we know of that can prevent or help prevent at least these kinds of abuses so that the international adoption of Korean children but children in general is one that can be more ethical and one that can be more humane. So I want to give an example of a more nuanced kind of approach to international adoption. Um, For my book, Global Families, I did archival research, intensive archival research in the organizational records of the International Social Service USA branch. This was a non-sectarian, non-governmental organization. And what I learned from doing archival research in their records was that they had facilitated and advocated for international adoption in some cases, while at the same time they promoted and advocated for indigenous social services within the Asian countries themselves, such as Korea, such as Japan, also in Hong Kong, for example. And I think this idea that international adoption can be a good solution, but at very specific times, alongside the view that Families, as much as possible, should be kept together and that children should remain with their families and in their home countries as much as possible. These views can coexist and create a more ethical approach to both international adoption and social service. And I think it does more justice to the process as a whole. And this viewpoint does more justice to a complex history that should go beyond binary interpretations. In a book chapter you wrote, you start off with a quote from Los Angeles Times staff writer Betty Jane Levine, who describes the orphans adopted by white American families as, and I quote, the first mass wave of international interracial adoptions ever on the planet, the forerunner of all those that have since become commonplace. What are the lessons that we should draw from this first wave, and have they been applied to more recent practices? I think there are a number of lessons that we can learn from the history of Korean international adoption and its significance in not only Korean history but world history. And the first is that international and transracial or interracial adoption has a history. And so when we see this phenomenon occurring in more recent times, we should look to this history and learn from it. We shouldn't just repeat the wheel, so to speak, with current events. I think the second lesson is that Because of this long history of Korean international adoption, those adoptees that were once children are now adults. And we now have multiple generations of Korean adoptees, older adults, middle-aged adults, younger adults, as well as children. And we can learn from their experiences and we need to listen to their experiences. So much of my research in the records revealed that the voices of the adoptees themselves were oftentimes missing from archival records. And what we see is a privileging of social workers' voices and experiences. We see a privileging of individual adoption advocates and their experiences, advocates like Harry Holt and what would become the Holt Adoption Program. 
So we don't see as much of the voices and experiences of the adoptees themselves. And now we don't have an excuse for that. Um, We don't have an excuse for that because so many of these adoptees are adults. They've become scholars themselves. I think of the work, for example, of Kim Park Nelson, who has just come out with a book on the experiences of Korean adoptees in the United States called Invisible Asians. I think of artists and filmmakers like Diane Bourchet Lim, um, for example, writers like Jane Jong Trenka, poets like Jennifer Kwan Dobbs and Lee Herrick, who have documented and written and produced knowledge and artistic work about the experiences of Korean adoptees that we have access to and that we need to listen to and we need to take into account as we move forward into the future of international adoption. We'd like to conclude by looking at some statistics. Over the course of the past 15 years, the numbers of international adoptions to the United States have fallen by two-thirds, from about 18,000 to around 6,000 per year. How do you interpret this data? In terms of the decline of numbers of international adoptions in the United States, I interpret this data as one, partly the result of new policies and laws in Asian sending countries, for example, in China, in Korea, that have tried to encourage more domestic adoption and have tried to discourage international adoption in various ways. But I also interpret these numbers in terms of more awareness about some of the abuses that have occurred historically regarding international adoption and that adoption should occur ethically and it should take time to adopt internationally. And so that time and that investment in more ethical adoptions has resulted, I think, in a longer process that has also reduced those numbers. I also think that some of these large sending countries like Korea, for example, have dramatically changed in terms of not only their current policy regarding international adoption, but places like China and Korea and Japan have become economic world powers. And so their economic situation in the late 20th and early 21st century is quite different than the way it was in the mid 20th century and there's more economic opportunity to keep families together. To finish off, international adoption has left its mark on America. You begin your book with an odd anecdote. Could you retell it here? And tell us what you think of what it says about how Americans themselves look at international adoption from Asia. In my book, Global Families, I begin with this story where it is the late 1990s. And at the time, I was an assistant professor of American studies at the University of Minnesota. And I was about to get my very young daughter ready from a lunch we were having at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. I was getting her ready from the end of our meal to go visit another place of the museum. And I was asked a question by a woman who I did not know. She asked me, where did your baby girl come from? And I paused for a moment because this woman was perhaps in her mid-60s, and I thought, well, I don't need to give this woman a lesson on sex and reproduction um, about where my daughter came from. So I thought uh, she was asking me a question that has often been posed to Asian Americans, like myself. I'm a Filipino American. And that question that has been posed to Asian Americans, whether they're newly arrived immigrants or third or fourth generation Asian Americans, is 
where are you from? And that's a question for which my answer, I'm from New York City, that's the place of my birth, that's often not the right answer to that question. When I'm being asked that question by typically a white American, they want to know, where am I really from? And it it speaks to that stereotype of being, of Asian Americans being perpetual foreigners in the United States. So I've been asked this question many times, and I responded, well, I am a second generation Filipino American. Now I'm I'm from the United States. And my husband is a third generation Korean American on his father's side and he's also a third generation Chinese American from his mother's side. And so my daughter is from here from the u.s she's a third generation filipino american and a fourth generation korean and chinese american from her father's side and this woman she listened to my response and she had this completely blank expression and i realized that i had completely misinterpreted her question because she was not asking me where i was from or where my daughter was really from and what she wanted to know was from where in Asia I had adopted my daughter. And then she explained that her own daughter had recently adopted a baby girl from China. And so I think this story might strike you and and most people as odd, and, and myself as well, it struck me as odd, because I look Asian and my daughter is looks Asian and so we bear this biological resemblance and yet she was asking me this question about where she was really from and this woman was assuming that because my daughter was Asian looking that she was adopted and what this reminded me of was how much of a social norm international adoption and specifically Asian international adoption has become in the late 20th and early 21st century. It's such a norm that the assumption of family making through adoption is one that is so popular, so widely spread. And so I I began with that story to get at that point that the United States is an international adoption nation, that all of us, and not just adoptive families, birth families, and adoptees themselves, but really all of us should know about. International adoption is a lens that helps us learn about how family is very much tied to migration and that intimacy must be understood in a global context. Professor Choi, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.